Hi, and welcome to Choose Your Issues, the podcast of the Objectivism Program here at the Salem Center at the University of Texas, Austin. As always, I'm Greg Salmieri of the Salem Center. Uh, my usual conversation partner, Ben Bayer, is here with us in spirit tonight, but not in person. But he's also here in image uh, because I want to uh, let everybody know that he's going to be giving a lecture uh, next week at around, um, I would say, 6.30. Uh, so that'll be in lieu of having this program next week. We're going to have a lecture by Ben Bayer on the right to abortion. Uh, and this is um, related to his recent book, The Sacredness of Abortion Rights, I think is the title of the book, or Why the Right to Abortion is Sacred. And um, I think it's an important topic, an issue I definitely think is timely, and but also of lasting importance and something I'm looking forward to our discussing. So I just want to plug that um, that lecture next week. It'll be... Uh, you know, broadcast as usual, and here in person in the uh, McCombs building for people who are near to campus and want to come. Today, we're choosing another issue. Uh, We're just back from spring break, and so what better time to turn our attention to education? And uh, with me to discuss it is uh, one of my favorite philosophers, Matt Bateman, who is the VP of Pedagogy at Higher Ground Education, and the um, head of the Montessorium think tank associated with Higher Ground. Uh, Matt and I go way back, and I should say we both have our children in uh, in schools run by Higher Ground, so we're both you know, personally invested in this as well as intellectually, and I'm on, an advisor to Montessorium. So this is kind of continuing and making public a kind of train of thought and conversation we've been having for some time. Uh, but the topic is objectivism in education. And so I want to start by asking you, Matt, what is the connection? What does objectivism as a philosophy have to say about education? And in particular, what's the connection between objectivism and Montessori? Yeah, so just on the general issue, and thanks for having me, um, and happy to continue this conversation in public. Um, um, so objectivism is a philosophy. It's Ayn Rand's philosophy, and it's one of the more worked out philosophical systems in the history of philosophy, which means that it has something to say about knowledge, about ethics. Um, I imagine that your viewers know something about objectivism, so I won't go on and on about it. Um, But education, so so objectivism doesn't have anything kind of, at its kind of core, it's not it's not a philosophy of education or it's not primarily about education. Primarily it's a philosophy, that's what it is. and Ayn Rand said a little bit about education, but not not a ton. She didn't write a treatise on education or really develop her thoughts that much, though what she said was interesting. Um, but education itself is inherently philosophical. Like education is the problem of um, how to help in a systematic way immature, juvenile, undeveloped humans become, um, become more mature, um, kind of exactly what that looks like is going to depend on your philosophy, which is part of why it's a philosophical question. But education concerns things like how do you get people to know stuff and how do you make people good? Um, And that gets you right into epistemology and ethics. And so, I mean, just first and foremost, the connection between objectivism and education is you would think that there are um, things that are suggestive or constraints if you think that objectivism is true or plausible that are relevant for education. And I think indeed there are. Um, um, so just as a couple of examples, um, one is that Rand has a whole view on what knowledge is. Um, she thinks that it's objective as opposed to, um, it, it's, it, it involves the mind actively, um, and lawfully, um, reaching out and conforming to reality and grasping reality. It's, it's an active process, but it's also, um, a reality-oriented process that has to do with the nature of reality and the nature of consciousness. So there's a whole philosophical view there. And um, and that means that um, it, it gives you a certain perspective on what knowledge is, what you're doing when you learn something. Are you just learning a bunch of words? Um, are you learning how to put together impressions? Or are you getting a perspective on the world, a kind of grasp on the world, um, which, is, which is her view? In ethics, she thinks that um, you should be selfish. You should be a certain kind of egoist that actually um, is effective at achieving their self-interest over the course of their lifetimes and that you build a, build a life for yourself and that you become an impassioned valuer. 
um, and that that has certain constraints too in terms of your um, the virtues that you practice, the habits that you develop, the ways that you go about doing that. Um, I think that that's more indirect, its implications for ethics, but or its implications for education, but it, it certainly is relevant, um, especially when you're thinking about what is the what is the purpose of education and what do you want a student to get from it. So um, that's just at the basic level. Like a philosophy should have something to say about how you come to know things and what kind of person, what kinds of people we want to create and what kinds of people we want to um, we want to develop. Um, your second question was about well, how does Montessori relate to all this? So how does Montessori relate to all this? So there, so there are a lot of objectivists that are very interested in Montessori, um, which you wouldn't necessarily, if you just kind of, if you knew something about Montessori and then you came to objectivism, this might be surprising to you. Um, the Montessori world, Montessori herself was certainly not an objectivist. Um, the Montessori world doesn't seem necessarily particularly politically or ethically aligned with objectivism. Um, but, um, Rand herself was a huge fan of Montessori. Um, she said very, very positive things about Montessori whenever she spoke about education. She was very impressed with Maria Montessori's work, particularly, um, um, her curriculum, Montessori's handbook, as it's described in Montessori's handbook, she cites a number of times. Um, and, um, and this has gotten a lot of people who are interested in objectivism, interested in education and what Montessori said. And in fact, I think there are a lot of synergies, even though it's not obvious like Montessori was like a Marxist Catholic Thomist, yeah. theosophist yeah I mean it's and Rand is none of those things um and you wouldn't think like if you kind of squint there's like an isomorphism there um but there sort of is when it comes to how Montessori thought about education and children um Montessori thought that education should be done very, starting very young from this kind of um that it should be built from experiences, built from sensory experience, that it was also conceptual, so that there was a kind of order to the mind um, that you could pattern off of perceptual material. So th there's a lot of things that synergize with the details of Rand's epistemology. Um, and there's also a lot of things that synergize with her ethics. I mean, Montessori was very pro-independence. She thought very, very highly of children. There's a whole dimension to Rand's thought, which maybe we could get into, that's interesting. Um, as a philosopher and also as a novelist, Rand has an unusual sensitivity to issues of psychological functioning that are relevant to development. Things like she came up with terms like psychoepistemology, like your automated view of um, <clears throat> your automated logic, your automated epistemology, or the se your sense of life, your kind of automated philosophy, your emotionally um, summed up metaphysics and philosophy. And that she ran thought that these things formed very young and that they were hard to change and so there, there's a kind of developmental sensitivity to Rand that really maps on very well to some of the things that Montessori says about human development so um that's the kind of philosophical intellectual connection I think let me ask a few questions kind of just taking us into this well let me see first of all I mean I'm one of those objectivists who got into Montessori from Ayn Rand yeah I um remember in graduate school well before I was thinking of having uh a child, but I guess I might have thought I might eventually have one. But just for epistemological reasons, I picked up um, Dr. Montessori's own handbook um, from the recommendations of it in some of Rand's periodicals. And I remember, you know, alternating reading the stuff I was reading for grad school and uh, reading her account of how to teach writing and how to teach reading to young children and some of the stuff about the math materials. And it's being part of my early thinking about what it's like to form concepts, what it's like to form skills. So maybe one place to pick up on something is I want to try to push in first on one of the more technical points, but in a way that maybe makes it more accessible. Yeah. So you mentioned Rand's view that knowledge is objective, uh, and let's bring in the contrast. So there's the idea that knowledge is objective as opposed to being intrinsic or subjective, or another way to put it is that knowledge is objective as opposed to being um, revealed or arbitrarily created. So the idea is there's a kind of work that you have to do to get your mind to grasp reality and to build up a more and more elaborate and nuanced and uh, grasp of reality that's true to reality. There's something you need to do to do that as opposed to just opening up your mind and passively receiving reality. That would be the kind of mystical or revelatory or intrinsic view. Or on the other hand, the view that, you know, you have to do a lot, but what you're doing is constructing something. And then what you know is not a world as it exists independent of ourselves, but 
what we constructed, what you yourself constructed, or what maybe a group of us together socially construct. So you see, it is an independent reality we can get at, but it takes a kind of work to get at it, not a, a reception of it. This is just a summary of the idea of what it means to say that knowledge is objective, um, that there's a kind of work to knowing, and it's the work of grasping reality. So what does... Tell me more about, particularly in early education, how Montessori reflects this kind of an orientation, and particularly as opposed to those foils of it's something we create, but it's not getting at things as they really are, uh, or it's we are getting at things as they really are, but because it's sort of just received by us. Yeah, so Montessori's view is that knowledge is created. I'm going to use that term. And I might qualify it or come back to it in a second, but it, it's the work of an individual. Knowledge is the work of an individual, so it's not something that an adult can give a child. It's not something that's like, I have this worked out view and I can, especially a young child, which is where Montessori did most of her work. Like, you can't just kind of tell a child things. The child receives them and now the child knows things. Um, a, because young children, you can't really, they, they don't really learn by explanation um, when they're very young. And B, just because that's not how the mind works in general. There's This is a general epistemological point. Um, the mind has to be active, it has to do something in order to turn whatever somebody is telling them or showing them into knowledge. Um, and children really struggle with this. Um, but it's also not like, I mean, the, the kind of contrast would be um, kind of what what, Mon what Rand would have considered pragmatist, um, what Montessori would have described as kind of more play-based um, educational approaches where the child goes out and they have contact with reality and they'll f maybe figure some stuff out just by playing and constructing things. Um, Montessori thought that this process of creating knowledge on the part of the young child should be very guided and constrained um, by specialized inputs. So she thought that you could kind of synthetically synthesize experiences for the child. Um, experiences that the child experiences of, that the child would have of reality. So things like physical materials in front of the child, things like certain special kinds of building blocks that are sorted in a certain way, things like the brown stair or the red rods or the pink tower, um, that would help the child see certain things, see certain that would make it very easy for the child to um, make some of these knowledge connections. Um, and so easy, in fact, for the young, for the very young child that it. it you know, not that it's guaranteed in the sense of like it just happens magically, but if the child is putting an effort, they're going to be led to certain conclusions, led to certain concepts. So, um, in the case of the sensorial materials that I just mentioned, um, the red rods are a material, uh, they're a sequence of rods. They vary by length only. They have the same width, the same height, but they vary by length. And then the brown stair varies in two dimensions. It varies in terms of, um, um, it's, uh, it has the same length, but it varies in terms of height and width. And then the pink tower varies in three dimensions. And I listed them in the opposite order that you would actually do them in the classroom. But um, the child is gradually learning how to compare and isolate attributes and sensitizing himself or herself to notions of um, width, length, and height, um, the kind of dimensions of space in ways that are um, relevant for how they will later learn mathematics and understand the geometric world. Um, and they're doing it by interacting with these materials in a very guided way. So it's the, the child is putting in a lot of work. They're experimenting with these materials, they're exploring them, they're comparing them, they're putting them to the left and the right, but they're coming to these concepts that are very objective, they're kind of paradigms of real concepts, mathematical concepts, objective concepts. And there's um, that kind of, that, that the child has to put in work but we're structuring the child's experience such that they're going to be able to easily reach certain valid, universally powerful conclusions, concepts, ideas, comparisons from their experience. That's the kind of Montessori paradigm. It's the structure that the child is free to use and explore, and that activity results in knowledge. So let me compare this back to the trichotomy we were talking about before, the objective, intrinsic, subjective, or the knowledge is hard-won work versus... Um, uh, intrinsic, something revealed, or subjective, something arbitrarily made up. Um, it's pretty easy to see what the intrinsic or revealed view of education would be. It would be kind of classical education, what something called the sta sage on the stage uh, in some Montessori literature, the idea, uh, I go to the kid and I tell him some stuff or show him some stuff, and you picture me like a pitcher filling him up with knowledge yeah. from the outside. So the idea is we can't have that. There's a kind of doing a work and engagement of putting together that someone has to do to know something as opposed to just be parodying words. And we want to create a situation in which the kid's doing that. We want him to be engaged. We want him to be active. Uh, we want him to be making the knowledge for himself. 
Okay, so we see how the kind of activity, the doing stuff is differentiated from the kind of intrinsic model. Can you say a bit about like what the more subjectivistic or constructionistic view in education would be so, and yeah. how the structures you're talking about differentiate Montessori from that? So here, I mean, this is this gets at controversies in Montessori. Some people are uncomfortable with this aspect of Montessori and she's always been criticized for it. But if a child decides that they want to turn the brown stairs into a toy train, um, the Montessori teacher will not allow that. They will redirect the child away from that. They'll say, that's not what these are for. Um, they're, they're to be used in a certain way for size comparisons. Um, this isn't just about like you do whatever you want and whatever conclusions you have to come to. There's a conclusion that you're supposed to reach from this or conclusion is too strong of a term, but there's a kind of skill that you're supposed to get, a certain kind of comparison that you're supposed to become more fluent in, a certain kind of spatial difference that you're supposed to become more sensitized to. Um, um, another example is um, there's these materials in Montessori called there's a whole bunch of materials that have to do with triangles. I'm just sticking with the math materials because they're very easy to describe and use, but there are other materials in, in what she calls the culture areas, science, um, geopolitics, history, things like that, and also literacy. Um, but the tri triangle materials really, I mean, if you have a three-year-old who is using, comparing and classifying different kinds of triangles with one another, um, and not just using them however they want, but really trying to be like, which ones of these have angles that, I mean, what the concepts that will later become isosceles or scaling, but they don't necessarily have those concepts right away. And then they go out into the world and they look around. What they notice are triangles everywhere. There's triangles everywhere. I can even kind of play a game with you right now where I'm like, I could probably sensitize you to things that you would then notice out in the world. That's the goal of these Montessori materials. It's to kind of make you notice things that you wouldn't otherwise notice out in the world, out in reality using a very specific set of materials. So it's 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 meant to drive you to a certain kind of lens or a certain kind of concept or a comparison that's, um, that the educator has considered to be important um, and that um, we want to impart to the child and that has a kind of validity or reality to it um, in, the, in the educator's judgment, in this case, geometry. There's certain materials used a certain way in certain orders that are supposed to lead to certain knowledge, and there's a curriculum. There's a curriculum, yeah. There's a curriculum, there's a whole scope and sequence, um, and it's it's an opinionated curriculum. It's, it's, it's you should use the pink tower before you use the brown stair, before you use the red rod, um, and there's reasons for that. And how does that relate to other methods of education, particularly in early education that stress engagement? There's a, a kind of view of progressive education that it's, you know, let the kid do whatever they want, and there's no rules and no structure. Is that... A, a caricature, or how accurate is it, and uh, wh wh where does the rubber meet the road in the differentiation of the Montessori approach from other engagement-oriented yeah. approaches or so, I mean, child approaches? It's not a caricature, but it's important to know that in 2023 that all of these other progressive schools of education have been influenced in small or large ways by Montessori, and many of them use Montessori materials. So it's it's not like there are very pure schools that are unmixed and um, that, I mean, Montessori is one of the purest schools in that respect. And, and um, so, so it's kind of unusual, um, but no, it's, it's not a caricature. I mean, I've worked in preschools where it was very, very play-based and the structure and the environment was different areas, what, what might be called different stations. Um, so there was a dress up station where the children would go and they would dress up as different roles. And there was a, reading station where there would be books and kind of random materials not ordered in any kind of particularly specific way. Maybe there's some easier materials and some harder materials, but nobody had like really thought through like what, like what is the way to kind of systematically generate these things. Um, um, there might not be anything on mathematics in these schools or not, there might be blocks and the idea would be like you can get some sort of math concepts from blocks, which is true. You can get some kind of math concepts from blocks, maybe sometimes kind of. And then every 45 minutes or every 30 minutes, you kind of have children choose a new station and cycle through the station and whatever they want to do goes. And there's not that much structure to it. There's not a structured set of lessons that you want to give or something like that. Um, Montessori is pretty structured in that respect. Um, so, I should say that for anyone here who wants to ask or say something, you should feel free to Hi. come up to the mic and we'll notice. Uh, in you know, We'll just continue talking back and yep. forth uh, until and unless it happens, but don't feel like there'll be a time at the end for you know that. Just come up whenever you think you have something to say. Um, but it's also like, I mean, just to kind of bring it back to the philosophical point, if you think that the paradigm of knowledge is something like scientific induction, mm -hmm. which I think 
that that is paradigmatic for objectivists for for Rand that you look out into the world you make systematic observations um, and you start to notice not in a kind of random you don't just make stuff up like a neo-kantian like i will try to impose some framework and then falsify it but there's certain things that follow from your observations and if you crystallize those in the right way then you will notice more things and certain things follow from those observations i mean that is it's a hard view to defend philosophically and that is the montessori paradigm so yeah that there's a kind of work of inducing there are right instances to be salient to you to induce from and there are ways to assist that process by having um, good examples or good induction bases yeah, there? Yeah, that, that, that reality that you can perceive truths and kind of build up a series of increasingly abstract truths in your mind um, by noticing things, by kind of extrospection and by careful comparison and, and kind of systematic thinking. And that that's a, that's a pretty constrained process, that reality constrains that process, um, and that you have to kind of think in a certain way to achieve that. I mean, most views in philosophy, it's either kind of like, I mean, the I mean, the kind of received paradigm in philosophy today is you kind of like make something up, who knows how, and then you test it. And then mm -hmm. maybe reality will contradict you, but there's not there's not a kind of detailed, rigorous process of like exactly how you should do that. There's not a science of discovery. It's kind know? of a uh, yeah. popular view, yeah. yeah. I mean, even you're using the word constraint a lot, and people use it about theories and, and, yeah. and ethics. I shy away from it mm -hmm. um, for just this reason, yeah. that this idea like the default is some free-for-all and something imposes order on it. But I think of it as like there are enabling conditions for knowledge. There are ways you have to go in order to know and they're kind of, I mean, this is another word that's freighted, but constitutive of what it is to be trying to know. Um, and but this is a somewhat optional ter ter terminology. But I want to think about if, if there's one thing to say that there's a, a process, a thing to do to come to know things from looking at data or from looking at whatever the kind of raw input is, and it's, it's not data in the sense of um, lab reports, but in the sense of... Uh, what's given in perception, that there is something given in perception, the perceptual world, and there are steps to build from that to more and more advanced knowledge, and that it occurs stepwise. There's one thing to think sort of, as a matter of epistemology, that's how knowledge works. And then there's another question, suppose that's how knowledge works. Mm -hmm. What can you do to assist someone in forming it? Mm -hmm. And I think um, you might think, well, nothing, people just do it or they don't. Yeah. Or you might think, no, you can acquaint them with the right kinds of uh, items in the right kind of order to yeah. make uh, to make this progression more salient, more yeah. apparent. And this, I mean, part of what's interesting here, which does get pretty technical, is that Rand, Rand's view of knowledge is that it's composed of concepts which are abstractions, and what is being abstracted out are precise values of certain attributes, the kind of the values of different variables, the variables being perceptible attributes at bottom, but um, kind of getting increasingly abstract. And I mean, Montessori doesn't have an epistemology that's worked out like this. She, she wouldn't kind of, I don't think she would assent or decline that statement. That's not how mm -hmm. she thinks about it. But um, kind of by working very carefully with children, mm -hmm. by being a kind of good pedagogue, um, she ended up generating a lot of materials that are very focused on attribute isolation and, and kind of task task isolation that, that in a way that's very friendly and comports very well to the objectivist epistemology. So. And yeah, particularly training along different dimensions of discrimination. Yeah. I mean, I think of all the sensory training materials in Montessori, there's, you know, identify notes and find the same note again and find the same color and then from more and more similar colors and walk across the room and find the same color patch. And um, there are these sequences that are, you know, training the senses, but it's also, you know, bigger and smaller in three dimensions, bigger and smaller in two dimensions. You mentioned the the rods and the tower and the stairs. There's also the, these cylinders that vary in different dimensions, and uh, you see children working with them, and there's a kind of getting the right database or something. Aristotle talks a lot about the, the stage of empiria, the stage of experience, and there seems to be a stage for him of kind of ordering your experiences yeah. by... Um, grouping things right that then puts you in a position to induce and i think of um of a lot of the montessori materials as setting that up 
for really early children. Yeah, and for very young children where it's like the thing that you need to order is like length versus width, which isn't naturally what comes up in education. It's not like, mm -hmm. like it's, it's not an, I don't think it's a natural thought that like, you need to teach people how to perceive colors. It's like, do you really like need to teach people how to perceive colors and order colors? And Montessori was kind of opinionated about this for good reasons, and she started very young for good reasons. And um, and the, the kind of order that you get is very perceptually fundamental. I, mean, I remember having a sense when I was a kid. You, when you're young enough, you just have these little fragments of bits of memories you can't really place together. But of like, you know, I had some set of, you know, some paradigm red thing and blue thing and yellow thing. And I could tell you what the colors were from that. Mm -hmm. I'm like, what color is the wall? Well, I don't even know if that is the color. It's not one of those five. And th there's there's a real process of going to like, no, if everything has a color that you can see. And then where does that come from? And how does that relate to this sample of greenness yeah. I've been given? I mean, if you're just, just observing my two-year-old, now three-year-old, she just turned three. Um, if she sees that like her shirt is purple, and a bottle cap is purple, that is cognitively thrilling to her. Mm -hmm. That's, I mean, it is, it is not subtle. She'll be like, they match, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, this is her personality too. But it kind of taking that seriously, like what is going on there in the child's mind such that it's incredibly exciting for them to notice something unbelievably trivial, trivial to adults to the point where it's like, is this even something that you have to learn? Mm -hmm. And clearly for her, it's something that she has to learn and put work into. And and the Montessori insight is like, okay, let's like really work that out and systematize that and leverage that and figure out how to support that using, you know, mm -hmm. Segun's materials and other kinds of materials that she developed. So And how much do they have to match for them to, to think they match yeah. and how are you making the cuts and so forth? And you can see a lot of testing with that. Mm -hmm. Like with my asking questions, you know, and uh, is this the same as that or, you know, um, being really interested in in what Aristotle would call whitest class generalizations, what things are commensurate, you know, do all boys have this? Do all you wear glasses and mommy doesn't? Do all women not wear glasses or the men and whatever? You know, uh, uh, clearly not. You, you know, but but looking, you know, trying all those generalizations out. I want to ask another epistemological kind of question, sure. though. Um, here on a point where there might seem to be more space between Montessori and random retention, so. Last time we had the show, we were talking uh, with Brian Kaplan, um, and one of the issues that came up was ran view that human beings are tabula rasa. We're not born with innate knowledge. Sure. Um, Montessori has a view of there being definite developmental stages. Mm -hmm. Maybe those are innate. I'm not sure how, how to think about them. Um, Biologically canalized is the term yeah. that I like. But how do how do you understand the issue of what's pre-programmed, pre-set, what's innate and what's learned and how those two things relate and what do each of these thinkers have to say about that? Um, so, so Montessori is, um, I mean, this, this would be um, disputed by some Montessorians, but she, she is a tabula rasa thinker. I mean, Montessori's view is that knowledge comes from the senses. I mean, that is very clear in her in her writing, um, that everything needs to be built up by experience. And, and it's clear both in her writing, in her pedagogy, in her correspondence with people like Annie Sullivan, who was Helen Keller's teacher, um, just that like re e really everything comes down to um, sensory knowledge. She's a kind of up Thomist, and there's yeah. the Thomist maxim, nothing's in the intellect that's not first in the senses. So yeah. It um, shouldn't be like an out of the blue shock. So the thing that Montessorians typically don't like about the um, tabula rasa view and why they criticize people like Locke, I think unjustly, is um, that Montessori, Montessori has a view that, that the mind of the child, of the young child, is inherently and innately different from the mind of the adult in very, very important ways, in very, very important ways for development and learning. So there, there are ways that children learn that adults cannot learn. And there are ways that adults learn that children cannot learn, um, and um, and it's and it's biological, it's neurological, it's, it's the brain. So it's, this isn't a matter of kind of your experience or your ideas or what you decide. This is this is a matter of the child's innate equipment, and amongst the child's innate powers are um, what what she called sensitive certain kinds of sensitivities, such as um, now this wouldn't be controversial, but in her time it was um, one of her insights. Um, a, a certain kind of special sensitivity to human language, to spoken language, such that children are very interested. Like a child, when you talk, will like a, a child of the right age will just like look at your mouth. 
Like they'll be very interested in your mouth. Um, they'll be very interested in the shapes that it makes and the sounds that it makes. And if you switch languages, very young children can notice that like, wait, something is different here because they're already starting to pick up and young children learn grammar perfectly. And they learn, I mean, in a, in a way that clearly they're not learning this like adults can learn it. Like how when an adult learns a second language, it's this process of comparing it to their first language and it's very conceptual and you've got to memorize vocabulary. Whatever is happening in the child seems superior to that in a lot of ways, but also first and foremost, just different. And for that to happen, they must have some, something about them must enable that. And I mean, this is Montessori's argument, and I think it's a true argument. So there's a certain kind of um, special sensitivity in the child's mind. That's one of them. Um, there are others as well for Montessori, which she calls the sense of order, which is a kind of technical term for her, but also um, a certain special capacity to um, organize organize their sensory experience, to learn how to move, to learn certain movements. Um, she thinks that young children go through a phase where, like, they're very interested in small things. This is a, I mean, she doesn't call this a full-blown sensitive period, but there's a there's a time, I mean, my toddler went through this, where she would notice, like, across the room, a speck on the wall that's, like, a different shade. Like, no older child or adult would notice that, and children seem very specially tuned to this, systematically attuned to it across cultures. So um, she was very interested in these kinds of differences. Now, I mean, the question is like, does that mean that the child has an innate knowledge of language or an innate knowledge of smallness or like, how do we make sense of this? Um, is that the question or? Yeah, yeah. And how do we make sense of it? And um, so less in terms of an alternate binary, you know, it's innate or it's not, but what, or it's knowledge or it's not, but how do we, what's the epistemic significance of this and what is it? So what Montessori says, she, she's not incredibly precise about this, but um I think what she says is accurate, is that the mind, you can think of the mind of the child as akin to a nebula. Um, she uses the term nebula and different kinds of Italian and Latin cognates for nebula to describe the child's subconscious or the child's brain. Is that at the time that, so my yeah. first association of nebula is like, you know, astrophysics and yeah. stars. Yeah. It, would this have been at the time too, or is there yeah. a more general? No, stardust. Okay. I mean, she thinks about it as like, I mean, the, the way that she thinks about it is there's a certain kind of stuff that like, looks like a kind of cloud of nothing, mm -hmm. but out of it somehow stars can form. Mm -hmm. So it's a special kind of stuff out of mm -hmm. which stars can form. And she thinks that the child's mind is a special kind of stuff out of which an adult mind can form. And you can't just start with an adult mind. You have to have the special stuff. And then that special mm -hmm. stuff for it to turn into an adult's mind has to interact with the content of reality, the kind of inputs of reality and perception in a certain way in order to start forming. And so this it's a kind very of potential that's being, yeah, that's being actualized. And if you kind of translate that into, you know, blank slate terms, um, it's, yeah, there's some, there's, I mean, or into objectivist terms, the, the mind of the child, the conscious, the kind of mind in a broad sense, which mm -hmm. would include the conscious and subconscious mind of the child, all of their faculties that allows the child to be conscious, um, has an identity. And that identity is different at an earlier developmental stage than at a later developmental stage, but that doesn't mean that um, it comes with content or it comes with knowledge or that there's there's somehow, whatever the mind is aware of, when it's aware of something somehow, that the something is somehow in the mind already. Um, and I, I think that that's, that's how I think about it. So it's the idea that, I mean, one of the things I, a point I often make about blank slate views um, is that there is, in writing about it now, this is in Stephen Pinker, for example, the kind of transmutation of the metaphor of a blank slate into the idea that the mind has no nature. Yeah. Where there's no human nature or no individuating nature, but blank slates have a nature. Right. For one, they're blank. For another, they're made out of granite or marble or whatever they're made out of, which is capable of being written on by carving, but not by some other means. Certain things will break them, certain things will write on them, etc. And I think that was always part of the idea of the mind as a blank slate in at least the serious philosophers who held it, Aristotle and Locke, and you know many others in their tradition, and certainly Rand. But Rand does stress a lot in a way that I think differentiates her from some other philosophers. The fact that the consciousness is a particular nature that must be obeyed to be commanded. And I wonder, um, yeah, she doesn't, for example, have any views about developmental stages or say much about well, that. Well, I mean, she says a little. I mean, so she says things like, um, a child's sense of whether or not the universe is intelligible and whether or not life is worth it forms at a very young age and it's doubtful mm. as to whether or not like really drastic mistakes or damage that happens at this age can be reversed later. I mean, that sounds like a sensitive period. It's like philosophical yeah. sensitive period. But, um, and, and it is, I mean, I think that that's the, one of the kinds of things that makes her um, really love Montessori and say nice things about Montessori is that Montessori writes about the child has a kind of 
sensitive period for order and Rand mm -hmm. very directly maps this onto, yeah, the child has a sensitive period. I mean, she doesn't say sensitive period, but the child has a time when they're developing their psychoepistemology. That's what the sense of order is. So mm -hmm. she just translates that into her own terms. Um, I don't like blank slate. I don't know. You and I might disagree on this. I, I just, the kind of pro blank slate, anti blank slate views, I find um, that whole, the debate is often just confused more often than not that it's um i'm like well what are we actually arguing about here well, like everybody i mean everybody who's serious thinks that the mind has a nature um and that there's some things that you learn and there's there's a question as to how that happens um like you might disagree about kind of what's in the mind or whether or not you should describe like i don't know like allison gopnik like whether or not you should describe the kind of perceptual system sense of object permanence as some sort of innate idea of an object. I don't think that you should, but th there's not, I, I don't find kind of blank slateist kind of debates or anti blank pro or anti blank slateist debates to be helpful. Um, it's a metaphor rather than a name for a position. Yeah. And so it shouldn't be, I don't know. I mean, I feel like I understood the metaphor in Locke. I understand the metaphor as it comes up in Aristotle. I understand it as it comes up in Rand. I think it, name something true and substantive. Um, but then when I see people reacting against the blank slate view, now they seem to me to have made a straw man of it, where they needn't have. Like Descartes has a view that's significantly different. Kant has a view that's yeah. significantly different. I mean, it's, it's an attempt to understand a view of human nature that is I mean, we, it would probably take us too far afield to discuss it, but it, it's an attempt to um, classify a certain kind of moral political tendency to think that you can overwrite human nature and, and kind of describe it in a certain way. And I just, I, I don't think that that's... I feel the, like that's become confused yeah, with... And I don't think that that's the right way to yeah. even describe that position. And so, uh, you know... Yeah. But I do think that the, the, when you look at development and learning, a lot of questions come up that are like, is... What would it mean for something to be innate content or knowledge? Yeah. And what would be evidence for or against it? And what would it matter if we count this thing as that or not? So there are a lot of deep questions. Montessorians there. kind of as a kind of movement of you know, scholars and educators, um, it's, I mean, it's in the water of the Montessori world that like you should be critical of Locke because Locke mm -hmm. thought that the mind was a blank slate. And it's, and in general, they think that you should be critical of Locke's view on education. And it's, completely wrong-headed everything that Montessorians say about Locke is totally inaccurate yeah that so, that was a um, if you read Locke on he has a book on, on yeah. education and it's it sounds almost proto-Montessori in some ways and it's really frustrating how he's interpreted to somebody who would be a you just pour knowledge into the kid's yeah. head and that's just not what I mean, he's about. I mean, which, and Locke is like, maybe you should see what the kid is interested in before yeah. you teach him. And like, you know, you don't have to, like maybe you should turn things into games. Like, and and then he just gets attacked as this kind of like, you know, reality just kind of writes on you. And, um, teacher's yeah. poor, yeah. Because Locke is very, um, he's not an empiricist in the, in the sense of empiricist that comes after him exactly. Yeah. And he's... Um, I mean, just as a history of education point, I don't think that anybody read Locke's book on education. And so they, um, I mean, I do a lot of work in the history of education too. So I think what happened is that people read Locke's essay. Locke's essay, the essay concerning human understanding was incredibly influential and people kind of read off or tried to deduce certain ideas about education that they thought would follow from that. And they ignored the fact that Locke was like an educator and a tutor for years and that he wrote works about this and that he had more nuanced thoughts on but it. But did so, even that, did, did people read off from his book on it, uh, from the essay stuff that they were trying to apply to education because they were trying to learn how to be educators based on Locke's theory, or rather did he become a a um, a totem or representative of something after the fact when people were looking for where's the source of this passive view of the mind? I, I don't know historically, but if you just read the essay, there's all this stuff and you have to be careful about the use of your mind and you should never admit something that you can't perceive the canal. Like, he's very active minded his description in book four of, of the essay. I just don't see how you would get this passive vessel view from 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 him. Yeah, maybe not. I mean maybe it's just kind of reading back empiricist kind of general kind of post human empiricist tendencies into him. So uh, for anyone, just a note for anyone who's interested in the history of philosophy here, the I think one really crucial thing to know about Locke, if you're thinking about it in the context of the history of 
empiricism and epistemologies. There's a chapter on the association of ideas in book four of the essay, I think it is, might be in book three, um, where he describes it as a certain kind of madness in people. And to compare that to what Hume says about it, I think gives you a major a major grasp on some an important shift in the history of thought. Uh, but we've got uh, Michael wanting to come in. <clears throat> yes, I'm curious about the way kids, kids' minds develop. Mm -hmm. Because as far as I know, Montessori schools usually have mixed-aged mm -hmm. classrooms. So does the mind develop based on how you use it or based on biology? Is it automatic or is it based on your own input as well? So the idea in Montessori that's now... Um, it's now pretty widespread in developmental psychology is that in the first 18 ish years of life, there's some dispute as to the exact cutoff, but in, in the kind of before full biological maturity, that there are um, developmental stages that, that the human mind, that the human being goes through. And a lot of these developmental stages have to do with psychology. Um, but at each stage, um, it's not like, when you turn seven now, you know arithmetic because you've hit that developmental stage. It's like it's like you're ready to know arithmetic. Um, I mean, Montessori thinks that you're ready to know it earlier, so that's a bad example. But um, you know, when you are two, um, you are ready to start to speak and start to um, certainly by the time you're two, you're ready to speak, but not just speak to learn lots of words and to start naming things. And you're very excited about that. And that's a sensitive period for that. And there's a kind of, there's a way that as an educator, you can be like, great, like you're in the sensitive period for language. I'm going to fuel that fire. I'm going to think about what kind of environment can I create? What kind of opportunities can I create? What kind of social interactions can I create that are going to kind of help you make the most of this very short, very special time when your brain is working in a certain way, when you're in this very specific developmental stage, or when you're an adolescent, to use a very different kind of example. Um, there is a brief time when you are, when, when Montessori thinks it's very, very important for you to understand that you can participate in the economy of civilization, that you can do work with your mind and your hand and earn real money. And if you kind of miss that window, if you learn that when you're like 25, as opposed to when you're like 13, um, it's not going to be fully emotionally real to you. And like, you're not going to kind of have the confidence um, and the kind of right view of humanity and the right positivity about your own work. You're not going to be as motivated. So you want to take advantage of these periods. That's biological, um, the period, but whether or not you take advantage of it, how it's used, how it's expressed, is up to the individual, up to the educators, um, that's up to circumstance. So I'm not totally sure how this relates to your question about mixed ages. It was, I was wondering how, how wide the span is. Oh, so this, the span in mono, I mean, it depends. So it goes from, I mean, roughly it's three years. I mean, that's the kind of simple answer. Hmm. There's a more complicated answer that I can give, but three to six is an age span. Um, <clears throat> six to nine is an age span. 9 to 12 is an age span. And so some of these, again, we can get into kind of fine distinctions of like, really, they are six-year age spans, and she's dividing them in two, and there's a difference between the first and the second stage. But um, And then for developmental purposes, there's differences between infants and toddlers. But yeah, you've got like three-year-olds and six-year-olds in the same room. Is the reason for that the idea that the three-year-olds and six-year-olds are in the same sensitive period? Um, um, or is it that... Um, so that they're all, you know, in effect, the same with respect to language learning or something, or is it that there are different sensitive periods that are going to come up within that window at different times for different kids, um, and that having people at different at those stages mixed is somehow is useful? So the the sensitive periods are um, kind of overlapping and nested with one another, so it's not like. It, between the ages of three and six, you're going to have some overlap in sensitive periods and some overlap and, and some non-overlap. Um, broadly speaking, Montessori would say they are in the period of having the absorbent mind, and specifically in the three to six period, they're in the period of what ha having what Montessori called the conscious absorbent mind, which is you're past the stage where you're just like, what is the world, and I'm perceiving it, and reality is writing on me in a kind of really strong way, informing my soul, and you're more like, I know terms for things, I know words for things, I, I know I, I want to know the, some of the reasons for things, I want to start spinning explanations. So that all happens in the three to six period, um, but there's variance in exactly what happens when you're three versus what happens when you're six. There's a big difference between a three-year-old and a six-year-old. Um, the reason, that, I mean, one of the reasons for mixed so that's the reason for bounding it. The reason to have mixed ages, there are more reasons to have mixed ages, um, which maybe you're not asking about. But um, I mean, Rand says things about 
this that I think are intriguing about how younger children look up to older children. And that's good that they do that. Like they don't just want people who are at their same stage of kind of relative ignorance. They want to, I mean, younger siblings look up to older siblings, um, older children look up to adults and teenagers, um, that there's something good and natural about that difference. And that Mont Montessori is very intentional about wanting to bake that in and capture that in her educational system. So, Sebastian? Yeah. Um, on talking about these like sensitive theories, yeah. um, does Montessori have a view of like the converse of what happens? If, if it's like a nebula, what happens if those stages... Um, let's say the nebula of adulthood doesn't form that like that, like arithmetic of language at those ages. And then they get past those sensitive periods without yep. that exposure. And so, then it's like, so it's going to form star is going to form out of the nebula, no matter what the question is, do you get a kind of crappy white dwarf? I don't know what kinds of stars are better or worse than others. I can't extend this metaphor, but um, I mean, the, so you're going to end up with an adult mind one way or the other. You can't, there's, there, there's no option of staying at the nebula stage and being like, well, I'm 18 and I skipped my sensitive period for language. So now I can learn a mother tongue. Like, in fact, if you're 18 and you've never been exposed to language, you're cr crippled in that way. And it takes like a special attention of experts to try to teach you a little bit of it. Um, so um, what happens is that your mind starts to change for biological reasons, but you haven't had the right nutrients, the right kind of epistemic nutrients for it to have the structures that it needs. And um, you end up having a mind that has various pathologies. You have, a, you have an unhealthy mind or kind of maldeveloped mind. Thinking about it all the way in terms of like adulthood. Yeah. But there's sensitive periods between that. And so if you have a student, say, in like the lower adolescence or even lower, like that has missed sensitive periods, um, uh, then later on do, like I'm guessing then that it's like there has to be special things that are neat that like educationally that need to be done yeah, the with same, the child it's the same issue just less dramatic than you've never learned language but um mm -hmm. um so montessori thinks that the the elementary years the ages between six and 12 are the right time to get general knowledge like um knowledge of history knowledge of science like the, the kind of like basic disciplinary knowledge he thinks that oh, the elementary years are the right reason for this for various reasons and children what part of what that means is that a seven-year-old is very, very, it's very easy to get a seven year old curious about like mince versus mustards or like, you know, whatever you're trying to teach them in the general science world. If you try to teach a 13 year old that and they've never had that, they're going to be like, why am I learning this? Now you need to give them a reason. And it's not like you can't teach, teach it to them. You can, but that there's, there's a kind of, um, you've missed a window. And so now you have to do it differently. And that often, re often remediation of some kind is needed. Even if remediation isn't needed, you can't use the same what she considered optimal methods because he was missed the window. So, yeah. Um, I have a few other bigger topics that I have yeah. a kind of philosophy of science question occurs to me because of this. So we should say, for people who don't know, your background is philosophy of science, particularly philosophy of psychology before you got into education. And the whole idea of a sensitive period for language, which I think is, there's clearly something right about it. Mm -hmm. But I wonder what to make about my understanding of evolution or what we know about, you know, human history, mm -hmm. is that there was seems to have been a long period where people were anatomically modern as far as we could tell. You can't, you know, examine the brains of people dead for all these years, but the skull shape was the same and so forth. And yet who either didn't have language or had very primitive language or the kind of explosion of, you know, cave paintings and other kinds of things at a certain time that has given anthropologists the idea that language or some new level of abstraction was reached after a long period of people just not having reached that. And there's a question as to, like, was there some biological change, some rather physiological change that mm -hmm. happened that enabled that? Or rather, was there a situation where we had biologically the same brains and we were able to use some of those abilities you know by building slightly better flints or something for millennia uh but then someone had the idea of language and that idea spread or the idea of more abstract language what is there anything we know about biology uh evolution as it relates to theory of mind that sheds light on that or how do you think about that whole issue i mean my pretty strong view is that we don't know um that these are 
every few years when you look at this debate, it's like like the data has changed a little bit. It's like uh, like the consensus used to be like language radiated out from you know probably Africa, and there were kind of linguistic and um, kind of genomic population genomic reasons to think this. And then it's like, well, language seems to have emerged at a lot of different places at around the same time. And what would have caused that? And um, there, there, there's, there's. Um, I mean, I don't know the answer to those questions. Is, is my kind of. Is, I think it's it's interesting. I certainly think that it's possible. It's not something that I at least know how to rule out that it would be. Um, kind of more fundamentally, a kind of cognitive social change in the environment that act that kind of activated something or um, co-opted something yeah. that, that kind of used some sort of brain structure as an acceptation and then um, and then that part that of kind of was our interesting why are you asking it's just, part of what's interesting to me about this and this is a little bit of a teaser for a talk I'm going to give in Athens in a couple of weeks on capitalism of all things is the idea in objectivism that we have to kind of learn to live up to human nature Mm -hmm. that there is a kind of human way of living, a right way of living defined by our nature, and that in some sense we don't know it. We don't automatically know it. We've muddled through so much of our history not knowing it. And um, can that be true? Can it be that there's some way we're kind of cut out to live that you know is the way that's optimal for us to live that lets us really live on a large scale and here we've been, you know, evolved well, as we are well, here's not. A, here's a way that we know that's true, that's relevant for education, mm -hmm. which is, um, um, I, I mean, the existence of education is basically coextensive with the existence of literary cultures. Mm -hmm. And so um, even if you think our capacity to speak language, to have a kind of oral culture, um, is biological, um, and there's not much more to say about that other than that there was some mutation somewhere, um, the capacity to write really changes what that means, mm -hmm. and it's not learned naturally. Like mm -hmm. every toddler learns at her mother's knee or his mother's knee language, um, but and that happens naturally. And you don't need you don't need schools to learn how to spoken language, but you definitely need schools to learn how to read and write. It's and, and it's it's this is why schools emerged. Um, a big reason why schools emerged in um, in, the, in classical antiquity. And it's not just that it changes. It's not just oh, now you have a power that you learn how to write. It's some technical skill. It cha then changes language, so it makes your capacity to speak um, and think and produce sentences much more um, kind of architecturally complex. Um, it increases, like just the fact that you can read increases the complexity of the thoughts that you can hold in your mind. There's there's a thing called back scanning that that happens only with reading that becomes relevant and kind of influences spoken language. So there's a whole story there. And Montessori, I mean, this is, Montessori makes this case that um, the capacity to write is unnatural in the sense mm -hmm. of not biological, and it completes, it kind of perfects the human capacity for language. And you, educators have to be very concerned with this, like getting with this both right. of those two facts. Yeah, yeah. I think so it's unnatural in the sense it doesn't come about by nature. Yeah but is natural in the sense that it somehow complements our nature or lets us get the most out of our nature. Yep. Um, I mean, I think so much about human life is like that. Mm -hmm. And I think that's sort of an, there have been several, I think, historical epochs of things like that changing. I don't know if language was one of them in the first place, but writing, scientific method, political freedom um, are things like this. And I think you could see if you look at, you know, human history and life expectancy, these changes that are due to that and that's something i'm going to be talking more about in my in my talk um but this is just it's got me thinking about evolutionary history and human prehistory in the kind of thing, what is it like to learn how to live as a human and for the species to have done it as well as for individuals to do it yeah i mean there are some interesting things that Montessori says about evolution that i think are mostly just wrong um, but they're interesting and that they kind of indicate like a metaphysics in a certain way of like you know, you should you should kind of be on the lookout for a way to perfect and harmonize nature. You know, that that's kind of what it amounts to. And she thinks that that's like part of nature, and you know, a god created us such that that mm -hmm. would be our task in the universe. But even if you don't think that, I mean, it's, it's a kind of interesting person. I mean, she calls human civilization supernature. I mean, this is a term that she has for it because she she thinks it's like na nature, like yeah, it's like there, and there's some good things about it, but like it kind of sucks, and we've you know ascended beyond it and perfected it in a certain way, and. 
Um, this is a, it's a dimension of Montessori thought that's very interesting and is mostly forgotten, honestly. So. You know, a lot of her pro-humanistic yep. ideas aren't taken up much. Yeah. Yep. Until you guys have started taking it up. Yeah, I mean, and, it's, and it, this is just part of a general, I mean, so Montessori is a kind of, like if you had to put her somewhere, you'd put her as a figure on the left, for sure, you would, mm -hmm. on, on the kind of political left. But what that, what the political left is has changed a lot over the last 120 years since Montessori started working. And part of what it meant to be on the political left in Italy in 1907 is that you were a socialist and a Marxist who was very concerned with production, civilization, and technology. And now part of what it means to be on the left is that you're critical of those things and you think that there should be mm -hmm. you know, some sort of um, scaling back of it or degrowth or um, that there are kind of externalities to those things. And Montessori has no view of that. And what was your view of humanity? Do you think of humanity as exceptional and good, yep. or do you think of it as some kind of hubristic um, blight on nature? Yeah, I mean, Montessori calls, she says that mankind is the king of the cosmos. Mm. So this brings us to the subject of values, yep. which is the next thing I wanted to ask you about. So do we teach values? You talked about Rand thinking we should be selfish. Is that the kind of thing you're trying to teach in <clears throat> schools? What values do you teach? How do you teach values? You had a thread on your approach to altruism in the classroom on Twitter. Yeah. I want to raise this whole issue. Like, should schools be value neutral? How do they teach value? So I don't think that schools can or should be value neutral, but it's not, I don't, it's complicated, especially when you're talking about somebody like Rand, because if you talk about values in the context of, of objectivism, the thing that people immediately think is that you're like, you know, every six, sixth grader should read The Fountainhead and you should like turn them all into little egoists and capitalists. And that, I don't think that, that's certainly not my view. I don't think it was Rand's view, um, and I don't think anything like that was Montessori's view either. So there's a so it's like okay, like you think that there should be values, but but not not you're not indoctrinating students. So what does that look like? And, and this is a really old question. I mean, this is a. I mean, can you even teach values? I mean, can can virtue be taught? Um, is is one of the animating questions of the entire Western tradition and philosophy. In particularly oh. of Plato's canon, which is you yep. might think of as the locus classicus for philosophy as such. And and Mo Montessori's answer and Rand's answer too, in a way, um, what what I get from. So Rand, if for those of you interested in objectivism and education who haven't looked into it, that I think that there are two essays to read, more than two, but the two main ones are, um, the Comparticos. Am I saying that right? It's a That's Spanish. Oh, I understood right? it. Didn't yeah. you say. So the Comparticos, and um. Um, the essay that was once called Art and Moral Treason, and I think it has a new name now. I think it's it still called that. I, think, I thought it was republished under a new name. Maybe it was published in multiple um, places. So it's called Art and Moral Treason, which... This that, is in, in the Romantic Manifesto. Yeah, so reading that title, you wouldn't think, this is an essay on education, but it really is. It's an, it's an essay on the kind of development of values. Um, 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 so... The kind of, I don't, I don't know exactly how to start on this. Maybe you can help me clarify this. So, so there's there's kind of an objectivism is Rand famously advocates for egoism as as a code of values. But there are issues in values that are kind of psychologically prior to what code you adopt, whether you're an egoist or an altruist, um, whether how you think about ethics in a systematic way. And um, and one of the most important for Rand is just the question of what is your capacity to value at all, um, and and to value in the sense that, in a human sense, but in, in a human version of how animals value, how how kind of other other things in biology in the biological world value, can you set goals that you pursue, and particularly for human beings, that means can you use your mind to kind of conceive of and set goals that you pursue, and that requires action, that requires energy, that requires passion, that requires um, that, that there's a whole look to being a valuer, to being ambitious. Um, and um, that is the issue that I think um, dominates education. It's um, are you setting up young minds to have this capacity to work, to set goals, to have values, to expend energy? And it's, it's in a certain ways kind of prior, psychologically prior, developmentally prior to what code of values do you want to adopt? And, um, and on that issue, 
um, we are very opinionated. Montessori's opinionated. Rand is opinionated on um, on things that you should do and things that you should not do in order to encourage children to develop interests, in order to enable the kinds of curiosities that they have, in order to allow them to have extended periods of concentration and success and kind of having action goal, goal setting action achievement cycles. Um, I mean, at, at the very young age, that's that's the most important thing. And what you're doing is, I mean, I mean, think about college students, college graduates. I don't know if you're listeners. Um, maybe this will be real for some of some, more real for some of you than others. There are people out there that just like don't care about stuff, and that their kind of issue is that they don't have that many interests or don't have that many things that they're interested in. And there are people that are on fire about things. And that, I mean, that's not the only issue here, but that kind of, that set of issues is, are you on fire about things? Can you apply yourself in the pursuit of them? Is it worth, Rand's question, is it worth it? Is your life worth it to you? That's developmental. I mean, that's a developmental issue. And so we do a lot in our schools to, um, to make sure that that, that is set. I think of this as really a central theme for Rand throughout her whole writing, uh, and I have a, an essay on it in, in a companion to Ayn Rand, the book I edited, called uh, something like Valuing and Ayn Rand's Conception of Value. It's chapter three in the companion. I forget what the final title of it is. But she has she talks a lot from some of her earliest notes about whether people know how to want or know how to value. And either it's something you have to learn and so yep. forth. And I think in the end, her ethics as a moral code is a kind of reflection of what the principles involved in knowing how to value are. So there's something you learn how to do, hopefully as a child, as part of normal development, and then you get a kind of, um, which is learning how to hold values and dedicate your life to them and have your life be about something, right? And then ethics is a kind of abstract reflection or understanding of how you do that that helps you guide it and do it better in the way that knowing grammar is a kind of abstract reflection and understanding of what you've learned in learning how to speak and helps you do it better and maybe at a more advanced level and epistemology is a kind of abstract articulation of what you learned in learning how to know that helps you you know then know in more sophisticated cases um but in any case this idea that there's something to learn how to value and some people know it and some don't and there's a kind of activity of reason involved that i think is really central to her but then does she have things to say about it in education or developing it? I think she has a lot to say about how it works. I don't yeah. think she has much to say about positive about education and how to develop it. But she does, because she just wasn't going to think of writing about that. But she does have a lot to say about things that could frustrate it. She says, I mean, what she says is that, I mean, the, one of the things that she says is that um, liter, literature, um, kind of narrative art, mm -hmm. um, is, um, and, and kind of narrative art with heroes is really critical for it and that uh and and there are things that you that an adult can do casually and kind of unthinkingly i mean you might think like yeah but every kid grows up with narratives but yeah but like do adults kind of like look down on it a little bit or make fun of it or like um and particularly do they make fun of the heroic yeah and and they're yeah is it kind of like everybody has feet of clay or that comes across somehow or like the adults are a little bit cynical about it that she thought could be really devastating but if you kind of i mean not quite read between the lines because it's in the lines, but just the idea that like children should have literary heroes, um, and that that there's a look to how kind of how that starts, it, and it starts looking a little bit cartoonish, where mm -hmm. it's like the literary hero might be like, I mean, this isn't the example that Rand used, but like a comic book cartoon space cowboy with superpowers, mm -hmm. and then like there's a stage, there's a kind of progression from going through that to like. You know, they're a detective. They're, there's somebody real. There's, this is somebody with kind of like real wisdom and increasing sophistication. And like you need kind of embodiments of that um, that, that that give the kind of emotionally ground a character that's a character in the sense of not a literary character, but a, a kind of human soul that that's worthwhile to you. Um, and that's I mean, I think that that's interesting. That's very interesting to me, especially since Montessori says nothing about literature. I mean, she, Montessori mm -hmm. says a lot about hero worship and history, and she's very for it. But I mean, the kind of there's a um there's something to work out there between Rand and Montessori. Mm. Yeah. That's interesting. Um I didn't know that Montessori said so little about literature. Which she says very little about literature and what she says is pretty negative. Um and mm. um there's some questions to ask there, like how much of it is like, well, what's the history of children's literature? Like mm -hmm. how many how like how many like novels were there really like that were good and directed towards seven year olds that weren't like totally fantastical and weird. Uh -huh. um, you know, in 1907 or whenever, maybe even earlier when she grew up that she would have been kind of thinking of naturally. Mm -hmm. um, but there, I mean, I think that, you know, there are other issues there too. Yeah.
And the other is just the other thing they think about from Rand is uh, on early childhood and the capacity to value people who are trying to stop and strike down children from pursuing yep. their interests, uh, the kind of uh, constant admonitions to not be selfish or yep. um, that that shut down or strike down seeds of ambition yep. or passion, so, and in particular ideals that are unrealizable and how they can crush the ability to form ideals. So here's a thing that I think concretely is a specific kind of pattern that is very common in schools and that we, I mean, you asked about my Twitter thread. Um, so there's a certain kind of thing, I mean, you could put it under the heading of service learning, though I, though I think it's broader than that, of certain kinds of student interests in school count and certain kinds of student interest morally count and certain kinds of student interests don't. So if a student organizes a litter cleanup of a beach, that's like, wow, like, look, at this is, this student is great. Like, you should give a presentation on it to the whole class and let's write an email. And if a student, like, you know, makes a website about a video game, it's like, yeah, that's fine, you know, like, it gets no kind of special accolades. Um, and, and that, I mean, certainly no special moral accolades where it's like, wow, like, it doesn't, I mean, think about the delta between, the, like, what would it take for a school to be like, this student, like, has a weird interest, but we're, like, taking it really seriously and elevating it. Um, and we, so that's, I think, I mean, that's one of the really negative impacts of altruism um, in, um, in education is when it divides the legitimate and exciting sphere of human values and activities in a way that I don't think is right and kind of don't think maps onto a, map, maps onto a good morality in a way that, that kind of deflates um, the moral import that a student might give a developing interest. And, and so if that, the right, the right. Um, approach to invert that, and if he does the beach cleanup to kind of poo poo no. it. Or? No, the, I think that the right approach is, um, I mean, what you're assessing is the student's motive. Um, so if the student has this as an authentic interest, and that's a question that, that educators need to ask because students can be interested in things because they want to please their parents, because they've got, you know, I mean, there's all sorts of in, student, student motivation can go wrong. Impress their friends. Impress their friends. Or, the video game thing. Right? Yeah. Um, but if this is like, no, this is like the student has a legitimate curiosity about this. They're really applying themselves and pursuing this. This this comes from the student's soul. This is them, and in Rand's terminology, this is them saying that they want something. It can be a beach cleanup that you want. That's fine. I mean, a student could legitimately want that. Um, that's that's um, It's not about the particular set of values. It's about the kind of form that it expresses itself. If the kind of judgment is that's what's going on here. And I, I think that that should be the default judgment. It should be something that you, I don't think it should be like the default judgment is that all students are second handed or something like that. The default judgment is that student interests are legitimate. Um, then it's celebrated and valorized, like morally valorized. Like this is treated as like, wow, like you're really um, extending yourself here. You're, you're kind of deepening something about yourself. This is worth pursuing. And, um, you know. It seems like what you're looking for is a student finding an opportunity to act to change things or promote or create something they've chosen it as important for whatever reason but they have something to say about it and they've and they see steps to making it real yeah and you're looking to spot that ability in children foster it devote resources to helping it but particularly encourage it flame that fan that fire yeah and I, I mean a minimum parent should be doing this um and i think i think that this should be done in schools i mean i think that this is actually part of education that there should be time in the week and the month um where um students have the time to pursue this sort of thing especially older students and where it's like really the kind of what Mon montessori calls it valorization um that where there's kind of the culture underlines that this is moral Excuse, this might be a little kind of like not rambly, but unclear because it's more of a question of something's not integrating rather than a clear sure. question. But so there's the there's the topic of values, and then there's the talk of, topic of like cognitive work and cognitive kind of like direction in a sense, kind of like the example with the um, the blocks being used as like oh yeah. you shouldn't use them as like a train, but you should use them as like analyzing dimensions, and I'm having. Uh, like difficulty integrating those two like in like in the one sense it's like we have a very specific um path and kind of objective with kind of like cognitive content but on the other hand with like values is a lot more of like 
uh, it just seems less of that. I, I wouldn't know how to describe it. Maybe I think it's a good question. I get what your question is. I'm not sure I can totally answer it in a satisfactory way, but um, Rand talks about there being two chains of abstractions. This is part of what's a good. This is I think it's an art of moral treason. Um, a, a kind of cognitive chain and a normative chain. Um, is that the terminology she uses? Yeah. Oh, wait, cognitive and yeah, normative. Yeah. Um, where um, you, you're kind of learning about what is and also learning about what's important and what you want and those two things um, are they're not like it's not like there are two realms and it, but they're 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 kind of distinctive processes that you can focus on in abstraction from one another yeah. and the um the curriculum it might be aesthetic actually cognitive and aesthetic oh, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. the the curriculum is um the, the kind of what you what most people think of as school like you're learning the subjects, you're learning the three R's, you're learning history, the, the kind of co the knowledge curriculum, the epistemic function of school is on one chain primarily. It's not unrelated to the other chain and there are ways that you kind of integrate it back, but it's, it's, um, it's, it's kind of primarily focused on the cognition. And then there's, a, I think that there's another chain that educators need to think about, um, again, relatedly, but separately, which is how do you, how do you kind of nurture student values and interests in this capacity to value? And I, I don't think that it's the same issue. I, I think that, um, I think that it's a lot of educators go wrong in thinking that it's just one or the other. So, they, so, so the view is that they are separate and require separate thinking, separate methodology, separate and maybe related. But... I think if you, if you don't think about both of them, you won't solve for both of them naturally is my view. So like, um, like, um, you might think that, um, if you really just get the curriculum, right, it will have heroes in history and there will be heroes in literature and that'll be enough. I don't think that that's right. I think that there needs to be more than that to kind of really actualize the child's, um, the capacity to value. But, or you might think if you just let children pursue their interests, this is the kind of progressive view, yeah. um, then like, they're going to learn what they need to know, like, because, because interests like values motivate knowledge in a kind of pragmatist sense and that's exciting and that, that that'll really stick and I I don't think that that's true either I think that um I think that you kind of there there's there's you could call them like more efficient structures but that undersells them it's like trying to build a house with hand tools versus like you know modern technology like I mean the the, the kind of help that you get from a curriculum is kind of incalculable I think it is in in the ordinary moral treason essay. It is normative of that she's talking about in particular, and it is about the ability to um, form a sense of values, to have things be important to you, um, to to understand what concepts like good and bad mean, in a way where they're um, properly motivated, and uh, there is a kind of learning to value there again. That I, I think a lot of her view on the negative side is that conventional morality, altruism, and religion both stifle that yeah um but then the, there's so one thing to say about it, you don't have those things there but then there's i think more to say than about the stepwise nature of what it's like to to get it and so one issue is literature is important i'm not what, sure what are, so my i mean here's a handful of things literature is important um i think it's important to treat um the rest of the content curriculum science literature mm -hmm. so, so science and history um um and even mathematics to some extent as um you're learning who discovered these things like you're learning that like it's not just like this is the stuff that's in the curriculum it's like th there was a guy euclid there was a guy newton there was i mean that this this knowledge came from somewhere that it was work i mean this is something that montessori is very good on that it was the work of somebody to discover this and they often fought against incredible injustice and prejudice to get this and so the hero story is kind of built into the very core of education um the um third thing i would say so there's literature there's kind of um the who did it the kind mm -hmm. of um, um throughout history kind of seeing seeing the content curriculum is very human the humanism there's um as students get older especially um certainly in adolescence but even in elementary school do they have opportunities to do projects and work that um, are increasingly real and even in adolescence for money um, where you're kind of going out, you're providing value, you're getting value, where you're participating in, Montessori thought that it was very important that teenagers participate in the economy. Um, I think for reasons of connecting up your value psychology to the world of actual civilization. Um, and then the fourth thing, which is the most fundamental in Montessori and, and in some ways the most interesting is for very young children, this kind of gets at some of the things you were saying, for very young children, um, 
do you have do they have long stretches of time where they are where they have a goal even if the goal is just cognitive like i want to arrange these things in a certain way um and they spend effort on it and they persist in it and they persist in it against distractions so do they have practice with persistence and concentration on things that they themselves set as goals and purposes and, and in montessori this is super important and central that um, young children get extended concentration time and so those are four things that i would say are critical to developing values that we offer in our schools i want to ask on the, a particular of this that we've talked about before where where we are in history on this so the idea of the hero story built into the, the yep. progress of science um what kind of curriculum is there on that so far and are you guys doing you know is that a an area where we need more certainly yeah even if there was a lot by her time, progress has been made since then. So, we, yeah, we need more. I mean, um, um, but um, but we have some stuff. So I don't know what exactly like, are you asking. What are like if someone is listening who's a parent of a six year old, a seven year old, a five year old, a twelve year old? Like, what are the killer resources on um, getting the hero story in science? What are you guys doing in the classrooms? Are there books? People should be getting for their kids. Um, yeah, or so, good so, Christmas so, gift. So yeah. we, what we've done is we've kind of taken good curricular resources, some of which we've created, some of which we haven't. Um, in, for example, science, and we've embedded them in a learning platform that also has resources where you can find about about the who did these things, and um, and there's kind of context and framing around kind of where this sits on the timeline of human history and who was involved. So have we done that for everything? No, but there, we've done it for a lot of things. So our curriculum, which you can access as a parent. Um, I'm at guidepostmontessori.com um, for the elementary school curriculum um, and thoughtandindustry.com for the middle and high school curriculum. Um, you know, um, ha has a lot of that. Is there a particular place on the webpage people can go to get more about the hero stories? And the so if you go to guidepost, so what you're looking for is you're, you're looking to get access to our learning platform, um, which is our kind of virtual school platform or our homeschooling platform. So you would go to guidepostmontessori.com and look for information about homeschooling and virtual school. And for people who have who have it, is there a particular? You just look on a subject, and you'll find the yeah. I mean, you should definitely find it interpolated into history, into the kind of mystery science lessons that we use and other things. So, Michael. Yeah, since you talked about values before, I was thinking one of the major ways kids experience values is by people who live the values, and especially teachers sure. around them. Yeah, and I. I assume that the relationship between a teacher and a kid is quite important. And it's mm -hmm. important for them to be themselves. Is there a virtue of being agnostic as a teacher or with values? Should, how much should you live them? And especially in relation to what you said before, like if a kid does something they're really passionate about, but it has is a bad value, you know, like they go to protest, I don't know, for socialism, you know, if they're older, or I don't know, they, they do something that you just object from your own values. So, I mean, I can just kind of give you an example as to how I would think about that as a parent, and then we can kind of extend that to um, um, to, to education. So if my, I don't know, my daughter is three, but let's say by the time she's 13, she's like really into like, I don't know, uh, what's something that I would drive me up the wall? She, she thinks that policy changes to build more houses are terrible you know and she's like a totally nimby like she, she you know against gentrification um she thinks that you know we should freeze construction and that we should have degrowth with respect to kind of housing and zoning um I, legitimately i mean who knows how this would play out but as a parent i would i mean my, my kind of prior instinct would be just like this is great like look look i mean she's just like she's like complaining about the world she's going out she's exercising and i the directions that i would push her are like okay like how are you going to do it like how are you going to think about it what are the arguments here is that the best argument um i, I think you would want to i mean i strongly disagree with that but i i think you would want to fuel that fire and that's definitely the attitude that an educator has to take it the educator has to say what there is good and authentic in this not second-handed but like re second-handed with respect to the political values but with respect to this student's interest this particular person's interest and how can i fuel that and make sure that it's separated from whatever is like you know just trying to impress girls or whatever would be the kind of second-hand motivation at this age um think about a, an analogy that i often use is um if you had a therapist that um started like trying to push you into voting for a different candidate or supporting different causes that would be like an ethical breach 
Like this is not what you hired the therapist for. You hired the therapist to like help you extend your agency in a more thoughtful way throughout more areas of your life and resolve personal conflicts. And I mean, whatever you hired the therapist for, um, like educators are kind of like there, there's a professional duty there to kind of, um, put your own views aside that aren't absolutely fundamental to the student's agency. And I, none of those issues are fundamental to a student's agency at that age. Um, so, um, that's my basic answer is that like, you're, you're judging motivation at a pretty fundamental level and, and there's there's not going to be a single political issue that you can name or moral issue where like some student couldn't have that as a legitimate interest like really like this isn't like co well, so covert, let's like... let's push that <laughs> yeah. suppose um a student is um very concerned about white replacement. Mm -hmm. um, and they have some, uh, and a part of what they want to do is put down their other classmates as anchor babies and so forth or whatever. I'm, uh, so something where it's uh, a view you view as racist, immoral, bad, and racism is I think the biggest taboo now. And some of the manifestations of it are such that you worry about it being harmful or damaging to their classmates them spouting propaganda or whatever in class um just i want to give like what would seem to be a hard case of this how I mean, do you we, handle I mean, that we, we face versions of this issue not quite as bad as you're describing but um um look I mean, I mean in this school there are norms that you're allowed to set in the school about how people are to be treated um, um and people are to be treated with dignity and with respect and not thought in a fundamental way with respect to their humanity as as lesser than and that's not to say that you have to be best friends with everybody, but you can't you can't say this person is less human than the other or express that in any number of ways, some of which are a matter of ethics and some of which are a matter of etiquette. And that's enforced in the school. And if that's just kind of the rules of the road in terms of the community, and that's also part of the values that we want to inculcate. So that, I mean, that we would be very strict about. Um, but that within those parameters, like if a student wants to get pretty nationalist or Trumpy, I mean, the educator would try to figure out a way to push it. And this is and, different and than Trumpy, though. It's a particular... Yeah. No, it's a subspecies of Trumpy. What about... Or it's wider, because there are yeah, uh, sure. plenty of that. But what, or so take another example. What about a situation where you have um, students who are gender nonconforming, uh, trans, and you have other students who one of the things they've gotten really interested in is... Um, the debate over this and they think well you're just pretending a man is a man and you're a woman or uh so they want to say things uh, like gender is real or sex is real in a way that other students interpret as a assault on their identity i mean this is the kind of situation that i would be called in to adjudicate but i think some of those things have to be allowed um and it's not like, clear which like, is the one allowed yeah so like side. sex sex is real for example mm -hmm. um and and it might be that like another student thinks like well your view and that has the implication that that is you know countermanding something very deep in my identity i don't exist or um yeah the kind of thing um, people say, but right? but what what um um what can't happen is that um so, so if a student's view is that, look, I think that sex is real, and by implication, I think that you're very confused about this, but they can't think that you're like not a human being. Mm -hmm. And and that, I mean, that sounds like a kind of pat thing to say, but it's not. It has to do with how you interface with them and how you express those views, if if you do, how sensitive you are to them, like whether you whether you see it as like this person is rotten because they think this is immoral, or like this person is struggling with something, or like I mean, there, there's a I mean, this is this is like a culture-wide issue right now, but I mean, and it seems uh, like in this issue you'd have um, interventions with both students. Yes, yeah. that is, yeah. you could imagine the student saying whatever sex is real in a way where he means it to be. Yeah, but or you could imagine someone saying it in a way that didn't have that implication, but a student taking it that way. Yeah, so there there are we've had students that say these things in ways that are fundamentally trollish and not not I th what I would call cognitive, not like they're really interested in this issue and they want to know the truth, but they're just like, they're like, they know that they can poke people's buttons and that's not okay. Like we don't say things to poke people's buttons in our schools. And we've had students kind of get on a high horse about like what's, what's, what's you know, like you're not towing the kind of, you know, establishment vaguely left of center line on this therefore you, you shouldn't be allowed to say it and you shouldn't be in the school and then we have to have a conversation and that there, might so. too be about pushing people's buttons yeah, exactly. feeling your oats uh yeah 
with political power. Yep. So a lot of it is is just assessing the motivation, or is it cognitive if you're putting it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, I mean, the kind of the thing that the thing that should be the common denominator that cuts through all that is: is there a genuine search for the truth here? Mm -hmm. um, and then the kind of social norms that um, that that has to you know: is there a genuine concern for the truth in a in an environment where we're also assuming that other people have a have a concern for the truth, where that's you know, enforced socially, mm -hmm. um, and that we have kind of elevated expectations about that, and where, um, you know, I mean, th we really do respect the dignity of people, or that that's the kind of like you're looking for the best in people, and you're 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 out to kind of love humanity, not um, not kind of dismiss part of it or only love a subsection of it. Sebastian, yeah, I think this is related to the difficult scenarios, but it's a little different than that. Um, in terms of the difficult scenarios and valuing what you often get instead of like, I really believe in X or I have the, like very, as opposed to very different beliefs, you get students that have, um, can be, they value something which you have a very, um, like an objective reason to say that's actually not very valuable for you. Like I want to just play video games all day and or yeah. I just want to secondhandedly do this or I just want to like go into something that's very addicting or I just want to like do nothing or I just want to doodle and I, I don't want it to amount to anything um and r r that's like one question like how do you deal with that and there's this related question um of kind of like when you approach the topic and you have two students and one says two plus two is four two plus two is five cognitively it's very easy to say like that's correct that's incorrect but value wise it's very difficult to say like, well, I want to, you know, the two students that I want to clean up the beach and I want to make a really cool project about video games. And that's like, oh, both of those are correct. But the student that it's like, oh, I just want to play video games all day. That's inc it's like, it's, it's, yeah. it's more, more difficult or it's harder to um, kind of control for that in um, a sense. I, don't know. I think it could be, it can be hard to state the principle on uh, kind of exactly what what differentiates these things, but um, um, in any particular case, but that is something that we're opinionated about. Playing video games in the kind of normal way that people play them as a hobby, um, like, um, let me put the point a little bit more specifically. It is, a, it is a, many teenagers have the problem that they substitute video games for real values, and that is a pathological motivation, and that's something that we look to kind of root out and correct and, and help the student with and we we aim to get the student on board with wanting to root that out and correct it and, and helping them helping them do it so um yeah it's not it's not that literally anything goes there's a kind of there's a there's a look there, there are criteria to what counts as work in the sense of um um the kind of thing that will, will produce a valuer and there's a lot of sensitivity that you need to have as an educator for, for a student who's struggling with that as to kind of like what the path is there I notice you're using the phrase "a look to" a lot, yeah. um, and that's interesting. It's kind of, um, you know, like the Greek a form. There's a character. There's a recognizable type of thing here that you can train your mind to be alert to and recognize when it comes up again, and you can form a concept for. And yeah, so I mean, yeah, so I think, I mean, I think I have somewhere worked out, like what the four or five criteria are for work or for, for mm -hmm. the kind of work that would produce a value that cuts across like childhood to adulthood, but I'm not going to be able to remember them. But I think, I mean, often it is like when you're in a particular situation, it's like not necessarily are you going through and applying that by rote in a kind of formulaic way, but it's like you're kind of, you're judging things in a context of a student who's probably has challenges and struggles and you're trying to figure out, you know, how to bend the path. And yeah, I mean, I do, I find the term look helpful. I hadn't been super self-conscious about it. But yeah. yeah, it's interesting to me that it's one of, if you think about how the term form and adolf and these things developed mm -hmm. in philosophy from words like that and i think there is a something right about the idea like you recognize this thing and there's a character to it there's a distinctive and it, it's on the way to forming yeah that. and i also think like it's the right way to put this point when education is going really well when a classroom or a school is going really well there's an aesthetic to it like 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 there's there are things about it that i can describe to you and you can be like wow that sounds really cool Matt, like I wish that my school had that. And there's things about it where I'm just like, you just need to see it. Like you need to, and, and it's not because it's ineffable or because I couldn't in principle describe it, but because like when you walk into a well-functioning Montessori classroom, it like hits you in the face that it's different and there's a whole dynamic that's different and, and you're kind of taking it all in. 
Um, and um, that is important to Montessori. Like it's important that um, it's a complex culture that you're producing that's hard to, that you can kind of give, describe and give the standards for and give the criteria for, but you, I mean, you really need to be a poet to describe it. And that the descriptions are trying to essentialize and concretize a complex yeah. phenomenon that um, they're trying to put your finger on something that you can see and can't quite put your finger on. Yep. But if you can't see it first, there you just have a finger with you know pointing. Yeah, like I mean, when I like when people ask me about Montessori, you know, to describe it de novo as though you've never seen it. I mean, the first time that I saw a Montessori classroom, I didn't really know much about Montessori, and I walked into a room of three to six year olds. And what it reminded me of was when I was a child, I mean, I had a pretty happy childhood and it included things like playing with Legos for hours and being obsessed with them or going out into the woods and building a treehouse. And every single student in this classroom was doing something with that level of intensity and joy, except they weren't playing with Legos. They were like learning how to write. And it's just like kind of seeing 24 students doing different things where like some of them are talking to one another and some of them are working by themselves and it's not clear what they're all doing, but it's very purposeful and very focused and nobody's lording over them and telling them like, you should do this or you should do that. They're all choosing it and they're three. Um, it's like hard to kind of capture in words, um, but it's it's like just seeing that that's possible and kind of and, and norming to that where you're like, this is the standard now, this is what we're shooting for is um, really critically important in education. It's like a total reset of expectations as to what's possible. Mm. Um, that would be a good note to end on, but I have okay. one more topic I want to sure. go into. Um, this kind of came up for me from reading a thread you had on um, taking children seriously, mm -hmm. but it's kind of gotten wider in my own thinking. So there's this movement people don't I know or group taking children seriously, David Deutsch and some other people are involved in it, that has a description of, of what's involved in education. People can look at it if they want. But what came away, what I took away from it is they had some ideal of how you would interact with children if you had nothing else to do in your life mm -hmm. but interact with the children. And everything else that you might do for some reason other than this is optimized for the child is seen as a kind of failing for that, failing from that ideal um, or failing to implement it. So the idea is you'd never kind of make the child do anything he didn't want to do. And well, what if I have to get out of the house at this amount of time? Well, you might have to, you know, you might not be able to implement it, but ideally you, that would never come up or you would never. And it seemed like if you had infinite time and nothing else to do in your life, um, here's how you'd interact with a kid. But it seems to me like that would be a really bad way to interact with a kid because part of what you're teaching children is that like you have a life and you're not just their servant all the time and they are going to grow up into a creature like you that has to have priorities and things to do and uh, isn't there to wait on their um, beck yeah. and call all the time. So what is there to say about how we integrate our own values and our own priorities into parenting, into teaching? Um, how do we not sacrifice for our children? Uh, is it important not to? How do we be egoistic with them in a way that really prioritizes and takes seriously their interests, but doesn't give them the message that they're to be sacrificed for? And I don't know if I'm going to be able to answer this. Yeah, so I'm, I don't know if I'm going to be able to answer this question fully, um, certainly not with respect to taking children seriously, which I feel like I only vaguely understand. Um, but um, let me say a couple of things. Um, so one is that um, do you know what like Lindy movements and uh, like kind of traditional like dance? No, like that, that's like Lindy Hop. Like Lindy isn't like traditional. Like it, like it's like practices that have endured for a long time or through most of human history. Anyway, the term isn't important. There's a there's a kind of there's a tendency in development and education um, and philosophy to think about kind of what's natural to human beings in terms of. Um, kind of more primitive social structures mm -hmm. um, or, or more historically early social structures to be completely politically correct, um, where, um, <clears throat> you know, most adults most of the time are um, working on things that are like pretty concretely important for human survival, um, like 
food and shelter and defense and things like that. And then when children are raised, they're kind of raised in this, there's not necessarily school. They're kind mm -hmm. of raised in an environment where they're exposed to this and they might be running around and playing with other children. And then at some point they start to help gradually more and more. And they're kind of like gradually interpolated into society. Um, and there's, there's a kind of mode of thinking where it's like, that's, that's how it should be like that. Like that's like the kind of natural way for, for children to kind of like, they go through these sensitive periods with, with a lot of freedom and they kind of see how society works and they like gradually learn and get interested in things and gradually participate in things. Um, what putting aside whether or not that's an accurate picture, I think it's not terribly inaccurate. Um, it's not a terribly inaccurate picture of, of, um, of child rearing in some cultures. Um, now, like most, a lot of families, like both parents work and they, you're growing up in a society where there's like cars everywhere. And if you just let your child into the streets, they'll like die. And even if they don't die, it's like weird, like for like, it would be like very weird for like a three-year-old to be walking around unsupervised in New York city in a way that is not weird for a three-year-old to be walking around, you know, a hunter gatherer society. Um, um, so should we go like, what's going on there? Should we re-architect society? Should we go back? Um, should you reorganize your life to kind of simulate that? Um, I think mo part of what I like about Montessori is that Montessori's solution to that is to say, there's no going back. What we need to do is we need to create a very synthetic solution, a kind of like technological solution to this problem where we create school environments, developmental environments, prepared environments um, that have like hyper engineered kind of um, facsimiles or versions of the things that children need in order to learn how to kind of engage with life and society and to learn, learn how the things we do. And those things are going to be different than the things that the hunter-gatherers needed because we now live in a complex society, but they're going to be analogous in certain ways because children can just interact with them and play with them and learn, learn in the natural sensitive period way that they learn. But it's all engineered. It's, it's like not something that exists <clears throat> in nature. And I think that that's the right view to take of childhood kind of in principle that um, you should see I mean, I, I work, my wife works, we're both very busy. Um, we both had children. I, I, I think that like we, we take the approach of, we delegate a lot of her upbringing to a school and the school thinks about it along the principles that I just described, which is like they take a developmentally serious <coughs> scientific approach to thinking about what would be an even better version of what kids get naturally mm -hmm. that, that's kind of suitable for civilization. So uh, I don't know if I'm really answering the question, but no. Part of it, I think, is when you're home with your kid, right? Mm -hmm. And this is where, or when you're dealing with someone else, it's like, should your interactions with them be all about them? Mm -hmm. And when should they, and when shouldn't they? Mm -hmm. Like, so Alan, you know, is wanting to do stuff with me all the time when we're home, and I'm often wanting to do things with him, but sometimes it's like, is it a good reason not to do the thing that I don't want to do it? And like, if I do do it when you don't want to do it with me, play with you in this way rather than that way, a lot of the times I'll do it. But, you know, if is it a good reason? Like, no, like, I don't want you to think that yeah. whatever you want goes because this relationship is totally unmutual, right? Like, part of it, like, sometimes people don't want to do what you want to do and let's find a compromise activity we both like. Um, and yeah, and that, I mean, that's very in line with what I think the taking children seriously people would say. Um, they're, they're all about conflict resolution. But I, I mean, the, the, um, the kind of the philosophical principle i think is something like your job as a parent is to channel reality to your child and that sounds very abstract and it is very abstract but that that means different things in different contexts um, that can mean the reality that People won't always do what you say when you feel like doing it. That could mean the reality that you, both of your parents work and have a schedule and you don't get to spend all day with them. That could mean the reality that um, there's a quantitative structure to the world that you can learn with your mind and therefore we're presenting you with these math materials in all sorts of ways. You're kind of, your job is not just to support their choices in some sort of abstract way of like, they're interested in things and they're growing and they're developing. It's to think about like, what are the essential things in reality for them to be plugged into and how does that interact with their development? And that's, I mean, that's what education is um, in a kind of systematic way, but that comes up in parenting too all the time. So um, yeah, it's, it's not, I mean, 
and this to tie it all the way back to objectivism, um, objectivism, the kind of fundamental tenet of objectivism is that you choose with your mind to make contact with reality um, and that that doesn't happen automatically and that you can disconnect yourself from reality in all sorts of ways in epistemology and ethics um, and that with a developing mind, like th thinking about how, how to apply that principle of like, how do I help this child get in contact with reality? That's not necessarily going to happen. And what that means in any particular circumstance is not obvious. Um, so, um, and that other people can be, um, people that you're cooperating with from a standpoint of both of you choosing and trying to get in touch with reality and working together in it, or other people can be, something that's picking up the slack for you yep. failing to make that choice. And uh, I think that's a, another important part of the philosophy. And I think both of those come up with part of what channeling, channeling reality is for a child is also like... I mean, what, there's, a, there's a way that civilization disconnects you from reality mm -hmm. in, a, in a good way. <laughs> like it disconnects you from... Not in a good way. I don't know exactly how to put this point precisely, but like softens the edges. It softens the edges. Like I mean, the kind of like everybody who's listening to this podcast is in one way or another growing up very comfortably, um, or, all, or probably everybody who's listening to it is growing up very comfortably. Um, and there is, I mean, to think about like how do you introduce children to the edges, the entropy, um, and, and all of its different forms, whether it's human conflict or just like the fact of death or the fact or, or all the work that it takes to produce all of this, like that is one of the challenges for education to solve because by default people will take it all for granted and it will be very padded. Um, so. Which, I mean, I don't think that you should like introduce hardship into your child's life artificially, but it is, um, it's Do you want to talk to about, about hot pans in this context? Oh my gosh. <laughs> My, she's bringing that up because my three-year-old decided uh, we have a ritual of making Sunday morning pancakes, and she decided this past Sunday that this was going to be the Sunday that she wants to move the hot pan by holding the pan edge, and where she didn't, so which I let her do on the premise that she will learn from this, and she decided to not learn from it and repeatedly burned herself in the pan. So that's something that we're processing. <laughs> Um, but that kind of, I mean, the kind of, the, I mean, yeah, the, the like Lenora Skenazi point of like, we like protect kids from risk and social risk, emotional risk, social risk, and physical risk too much. And they grow up unable to manage risk. That's true. Like, and that, that's an educational and parenting principle. And you've defined the ways to expose yeah. them to that risk. And I, and I think part of it, I mean, I'm very loath to give people advice on, on raising kids because I've only been at it for a few years and. Uh, and and I haven't read all that much about it. I mean, I've read, but I can't. But um, but I think part of it has to be that you want to communicate to them that you're they're a very important value in your life, mm -hmm. but and they have rights to expect and demand things from you because you have obligations to them. But your life is about things other than them as well, and that you're a person that they have to interact with with your own interests and values. And um, I worry about views of parenting that make it seem like the parent's life should revolve wholly and only around the child uh, or that have that kind of as a hidden implicit premise and uh, yeah i mean i can't i also worry about that i can't i, I don't feel like i can when I understand a view that I disagree with really well, I can kind of like channel. Mm -hmm. like, well, here's I, what I, don't, responsibility I don't know that that's be, and true so, and, of the taking children and so, seriously. And so I don't, but I don't feel like, like I feel like, like if the view is like, yeah, education should basically take the form of something like tutoring for a long time. And mm -hmm. if the parents can't do it, then you should hire somebody to, yeah. to do it. And like, we could figure out a structure to do that. Or like, even if we don't know how now, there's a way to mm -hmm. do that. Like, I, like, I feel like that's going to be the view, even though I, I don't know mm -hmm. that for sure. And it's not a crazy view. So, mm -hmm. But yeah. putting aside that, I think there's a, a way in which you could feel bad being with you, no, I don't. This is for me, you know, having things that are for yourself with your child. Um, so here, here's a, here's a, and I think people shouldn't feel that. Here's about. a mind bender. Um, so one of the things that I don't know, people of a certain sort, of which I think objectivists are in this category, are often on about is um, kind of inappropriate shoulds. 
and inappropriate and I need to, I have to, like kind of mm-hmm. letting the language of duty and obligation that that isn't kind of grounded in your own values enter into your mm-hmm. into your language and in your way of speaking. Um, so when Alice, my daughter, says, Daddy, I want you to stay here and I have to go to work, the natural thing to say is I have to go to work. Mm-hmm. And I have kind of gone on a campaign with her and myself and to be like, you know, I love playing with you, but right now I actually would really, I really want to go to work. Mm-hmm. And saying, I want to go to work. I love my work. Like, this is something that I love. Um, and I think that that's important to get across. And, you know, and you can say it in a way where it's not like, I love my work more than you. Or it's like, right. like sometimes I love my work and I love you. And like, they're right. both part of my life, you know. And you can probably um, use the have language in yeah, a way that can, communicates yeah. You know, but I want this as well. You but. can, but it's very, I mean, the natural thing to say, yeah. even for me in that situation is, oh, I'm so, so sorry, sweetie, but I've got to go to work. It sounds like yeah, you'd really prefer to be with her, but like, you've got this thing that tears you away. And I want her to know that like, that's not the case. Like, this mm-hmm. is like my considered judgment is I'm going to work right now and you're going to school. And that's my preference for how, how, how my day is going to go. You know, so. Um. All right. Well, I think. Uh, both of our preferences is probably mm-hmm. to get on to the next part of our day. We've gone a little longer than I, I thought we would. Thanks, everyone, for uh, your questions, and thanks, everyone, choices. for watching. What? We didn't talk about school choice We at didn't all. talk about school we choice at all issues. on this. We chose, is it because we've done, a, we did a, a panel on that some time ago. Okay. Do you have any, I mean, if you want to say something quick about it. I mean, the quick, the, I think the quick thing to say is that the school choice movement right now is good and exciting. That's the kind of fundamental thing to say. Um, with respect to objectivism, Rand has a really awesome article on this topic that's like deep in all the ways that it typically is called um, Tax Credits for Education. I can't remember what it's reprinted in. Um, I'm not sure either, but Tax Credits for Education, if you um, Google it, you'll find it. And um, and her proposal is different. It's probably in Voice of Reason. I yeah, Voice of Reason, yeah. Her proposal is a little bit different. I mean, kind of what you get in the school choice movement today is some form or other of vouchers or, or educational savings accounts. Um, and the kind of, you know, the history, the recent history of it is that in the kind of this movement starts in the 60s with a kind of like, what is it like a horseshoe convergence of like people on the far left and the far right who want something very different, but it's still a pretty fringe thing. And now it's getting pretty mainstream for, for a confluence of reasons. I think that that's really exciting. Um, I also think that the school choice movement is kind of pushing into its, so it's it's good. It's really, really important. I mean, the kind of philosophical thing to say about the school choice movement is that it's good and that um, the way that education works in the U.S. in particular, the public education system, is really awful um, and is very subject to objectivist and Randian critique. Like it's like Soviet farm level awful of like we've taken this entire field of education and collectivized it and, and it's kind of hard to even see how bad it is. Um, what it is to collectivize a field, to um, socialize it, to nationalize it, to put everybody and their resources together and do it as a collective thing is to drive the mind out of it, yeah. to drive justice out of it, to necessarily make it subject to um, all, every prejudice in the society in terms of how it's governed, including especially the prejudices people aren't willing to admit. And that's what we've been doing for ed- to education for not just a few decades, but hundreds years. of years, uh, at least 100 years. Yeah, 100 years. 100 years we've been doing it in the kind of scaled, tailorized, bureaucratic, you know, kind of like, you know, seeing like a state way of doing it. Um, and the solution isn't to localize it. No. It's to free people from one another. So, and I think that the school choice is good in that respect, very good. Um, but it is, I think it's going to face, it's, I think it's kind of unprepared for its successes. Um, so I think it's going to face challenges of like, great, so, because it works via vouchers um, and, and kind of, so it, it's still, dispersing public funds and those public funds are going to get used for things that are even crazier than what you get now in public schools and people are going to object to it and so it's, it's going to enter into an interesting phase but um best resources on this to recommend um the one is rand's article um so look at rand's article um i'm not actually a school choice policy do you have any resources that are that come to mind um ray camille and ray gern camille foster and i did a panel on um, First Amendment and public education uh, a couple of years ago. It's on the Salem Center channel. There were some Montessori or higher ground events connected to this yeah. too. And there were there was a person who was doing, uh, I think from TPPF actually, who was talking about policy on this issue. 
So here, here's one, one more thing to say, which is a point that I like to make to this kind of audience, which is that, um, and I don't think it's something that Rand was, not that she was insensitive to it, but it wasn't something that she was on about. And it's not something that I think objectivists have been on about historically, which is that um, education is a very immature field. So if you think about what we did with children before Montessori, like in 1850, young children, children under the age of six, um, it was really bad. I mean, we, like the, the kind of ideal was that they would just stay out of the way and, um, um, you know, uh, Montessori completely revolutionized the idea that a three-year-old could learn how to read and write um, and learn all this stuff and was very active. Like it was a total ch like mind shift, a huge mind shift, like a Copernican revolution in how we think about small children. That has yet to come for older students. Like I mean, the, the education that we have today hasn't really changed much in the last 2,600 years, and it's like pre-Galenic medicine. And so there's just a lot of thinking and innovation and curricular work and thinking about structures and developmental needs. It, it's it's a field that um, where for we need kind of engineers. Don't, have, don't know who Galen was or don't have the term oh. Galenic or automatized. Um, so pre-astrophysics before bra like an early science, like a, like a science where it's like, it hasn't you know, yet been formed as a science. It, it hasn't yet been formed as a science and where like, yeah, like people go to the doctor and they might be able to set a bone, but they might also harm you and what they're doing. And like, there's not kind of principles and, um, and so far as their principles, they're as likely to be wrong as they are to be right. Like that's edu I mean, the best education that you can get right now has a lot of that. Like, it's not like the best education is very good. The best education won't cure cancer. I mean, like it's like trying to cure cancer. Like if you want cancer treated, um, in you know the sixth century BC, like that's what education is like today. So it's, it's a lot to be learned and discovered. It's a lot to be learned and discovered, and I don't think that I think that I'm very sensitive to people thinking about it as like if you kind of take the best of the classical stuff and you add some you know hierarchical logic from objectivism that like you'll like I mean you will have something much better than what we have today. That's not a bad thing to do, but just you should think about education in 500 years as like in a free society is unrecognizably different. So part um, of the issue is this is a place where mm -hmm. innovation is desperately needed and possible and illegal, yep. effectively, yep. by the fact that all the resources that could power it and all the people who could seek it out for themselves and their children are unable to do it it's by incredibly the fact costly. that we're shackled you can't draw together. Talent. And yeah, I mean, the kind of regulatory, the tax structure, but also the regulatory structure is just awful um, for education so insofar as there have been advances at all it's been pretty incredible so you know. so let's end on a positive note advances um advances in education there are there are lots of advances i mean montessori is a huge huge leap forward in education i go back and forth on I mean, it's like montessori like newton or like you know copernicus or kepler or brahe or something i, I don't know exactly where to rank her well, what um, about advances in the last 10 years what are you guys doing that you're excited about? And what else is there in the world? Um, there's a lot of great stuff in the world. I think that the um, some of it is um, if you if, if so the, there, there's a way that the future is here and very unevenly distributed. So if if you know where to look in terms of literacy and math curriculum, in terms of um, online resources um, for um, history and science education, you, you can find material that I think is vastly better than anything that you could have found 20 years ago. Um, so um, some of that is the kind of influence of Montessori percolating out. It's just, just as like one example of this that anybody listening to this can go and use, um, there, is a, there is a program called Euclid the Game, which is um, the first few books of Euclid, Euclid's Elements turned into like, I don't know what it is now. Originally it was like a shockwave flash game back when it was created, but um, it's, a, it's a web app. And it's like, it starts you out with simple principles of constructive geometry and, and you slowly build up the, the kind of um, complex proofs of Euclidean geometry, but you're just playing a game. Like it's incredibly fun, it's incredibly cool. There's all sorts of things like that in math education. Um, some of which are like slightly more sophisticated versions of things that I think are primitive, like IXL, and some of which are pretty sophisticated like Desmos. Um, Khan Academy is somewhere in the middle. Um, there are a lot of objectivists working in education. Not that objectivists are the main or only people I'm driving advances, but um, I mean, the fact that mystery science, the science curriculum used in elementary schools across the country is designed by objectivists is, I think, notable. 
um, the people that made that are now working on um, the explanation. Company. Yeah, explanatory interfaces for children to kind of like ed, ed tech things that I think are really cool. So this is uh, say, yeah. Doug Peltz and Keith Schacht. For anyone who's listening, you could look them up. And there are also a few other education companies that have objectives in them. Aside yeah, from ed, the ed Puzzle, um, which is a curriculum company and an online platform, has good objectivists working on their curriculum um, and th thoughtful people who are influenced by Rand working on their curriculum. I don't know where Reasoning Minds is anymore, but um, um, it's a math curriculum that I think is quite good influenced by a variety of things and kind of interpolated by um, objectivist kind of thought leaders at the top. So, um, and, and, th and I'm not just recommending these things because they're done by objectivists. Um, I'm recommending them because I think that they're good. And then, um, and then there, I mean, there have been objectivist educators for years. So Lisa Van Dam's school. And Lisa Van, Van Dam's Dam Read With Me course that people can. Yeah. So her school is this kind of incredibly um, kind of intentional boutique application of, um, 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 kind of objectivist curricular principles um, for I think it's K eight, um, and um, and then she has she has additional literature courses that are incredible. Yeah. Um, Lisa Van Dam has additional literature courses. Yeah. So where can people go to find out more about what you're doing if anyone's under a rock and doesn't know? So um, Montessorium.com is where I publish most of my philosophical writing about education. Um, I'm very active on Twitter. I'm M. Bateman on Twitter. Um, I talk about parenting a lot, um, especially on Twitter. And then Higher Ground Education, I've already mentioned guidepostmontessori.com is our early childhood and elementary program. Um, we have middle schools and high schools called the Academy of Thought and Industry. We have a teacher training program called the Prepared Montessori. And so we're doing a lot. You can find it all at 2tohigherground.com. So that's a lot for people who are interested in education. Uh, for people who want to go into the field and work in education, uh, for people who have children and want to know what's best for them, and for people who just want to understand how um, how human minds develop and what we can do about it. Uh, thanks, Matt, for being with us. One thing I think this whole discussion, though, highlights is the seriousness of having children. Uh, education matters. It's hard. It requires thought. And it's kind of delegated parenting. You have to think about if you're going to be a parent, who you want to delegate it to. Do you want to delegate it? Do you have the resources to do it, especially given that we're in a society where so many of your resources are taken from you to fund kinds of education that you may or may not think are good. Uh, so having children, serious issue. And that brings us to our topic for next week. Mm -hmm. Dr. Ben Bayer will be talking about why there is an individual right to abortion a right to choose whether this is a project you want to take on. I'll see you all then. Thank you.